It's a great irony that Buddhism is often presented as being defeatist. And the Buddha is portrayed as saying that your body is impermanent, your mind is impermanent, the world is impermanent. Anything you try for would be impermanent, so just give up. You'd be happier not trying. Which, of course, is nothing at all like what the Buddha actually said. One of his terms for the Noble Eightfold Path was unexcelled victory in battle. He you know, often uses images drawn from soldiers in battle to compare the, the successful meditator to a soldier who comes out victorious. And the word success there is another one that's treated ironically often in Buddhist circles. That you don't try to succeed in meditation. There is no such thing as a good meditation. Everything is just about accepting things as they are. There's no success. There's no failure. That too is not true. The Buddha presented his path of practice in one version as four bases for success. He was very clear about there's successful meditation and unsuccessful meditation. There is a goal, and it's worth attaining, and it's worth focusing your efforts on attaining. Simply it's an issue of learning how to be mature in how you go about it. The four bases for success are desire, persistence, intent, and your ingenuity. The desire there comes first, because it's your motivation. You have to want to do the practice. William James once made a distinction between two kinds of truth. There's the truth of the observer, in which your desires should not get in the way if you're going to see the truth. In other words, things like measuring the gravity of the sun, measuring the orbits of the planets, running scientific experiments. If you desire things to come out in a certain way and you skew the results in that direction, your desire is going to ruin your chances to actually see the truth about these things. But there's another kind of truth. There's the truth of the will. Things that will become true only if you want them to become true. If you want to be good at a sport, you want to be good at a musical instrument, any skill. You want to be good at cooking, you want to be good at carpentry. You have to want it to happen for it to happen. And the path is that second kind of truth. It's not going to happen on its own. There are passages that say if, once you get started, then each step follows naturally from the, the preceding one you know, without you having to desire it. But you have to have the desire to begin with. Without that initial desire, it's not going to happen. And you have to have the desire to persist. So you have to learn how to motivate yourself. Make yourself want to do this. And in whatever way works with your mind, you can use thoughts of heedfulness, thoughts of, in other words, thoughts of the dangers that come when you don't master the skill. Or thoughts of the benefits that come when you do. They've done studies of people who are especially skilled in their areas of expertise. And they found the ones that are excellent as opposed to the ones who are merely good at those particular fields have a very strong sense that if the skill is not mastered, there's danger. If the skill is mastered, there's going to be well-being. There's going to be safety. So that's one way of motivating yourself. Another way is out of compassion. After all, we are doing this for the sake of putting an end to suffering. There's one passage where the Buddha talks about a monk who's beginning to get discouraged in his practice and thinking of giving up. And he says, you should ask yourself, don't you love yourself? Didn't you start this practice of putting an end to suffering? If you stop the practice, what's going to happen? Are you giving up on your desire for happiness? So compassion for yourself, compassion for others is also a good motivating factor. If you develop more skillful qualities in the mind and can abandon unskillful ones, the people around you 
are going to benefit from your presence as opposed to being harassed by your presence. So lots of ways to motivate yourself. With the motivation then comes the second base for power, which is persistence. You really stick with it. As John Fuang used to say, you have to be crazy about the meditation in order to do it well. This is where if you have obsessive tendencies, they're useful. You have a few free minutes, you focus on your breath. You stop at a stoplight, you focus on your breath. You're sitting in a doctor's office, you're waiting for in a waiting room, you, know, you focus on your breath. You're standing in line, you focus on your breath. You're sitting in a boring meeting, you focus on your breath. Every time you got a chance, keep coming back to the breath. And that kind of persistence is going to pay off. But simple persistence on its own is not enough. You can't just take nirvana by storm. You need the other basis for power, which the first one is intent. I mean, you focus really carefully on what you're doing and what results you're getting. You pay very careful attention. This is how the Buddha was able to find the path to begin with. He noticed he wasn't getting the results he wanted, and so he looked back on his actions. What's lacking in my actions? What am I doing wrong? What can I change? Which means you have to look very carefully at what you're doing, very carefully at what the results are. That's what intent is all about. You try to be as sensitive as you can to what you're doing. This is what you can use to temper your brute force as you push at the practice. This is where you begin to learn what needs to be changed. And this is what the fourth base for power is, your ingenuity. When you see you're not getting the results you want, you try to figure out, okay, why? What can I change? These two qualities correspond to what John Fuhn would talk about more than anything else when he was giving meditation instructions. One, be observant. Two, use your ingenuity. As he said, if we could get to nirvana simply by desire or simply through effort, everybody would have gone to nirvana a long time ago. It's using your sensitivity, your powers of observation, and your ingenuity. That's what allows you to temper your efforts so they are not just right in a general direction, but actually just right. This is where the element of discernment really has to come into the path. And the Buddha talks about the middle way, this unexcelled victory in battle, as being a middle way between two extremes. Now we could find our way to two happiness simply by being extremely accepting or extremely effortful. Again, it would be very easy, but it requires finding the middle way between those two extremes of what's just right, what kind of effort applied at what time, to what extent is just right, and what kind of effort misses that point of just right. This is where you have to observe. and evaluate. Use your ingenuity to figure out other ways of approaching things that you might not have thought of before. Because we are learning a skill. And as with any skill, you do it, and then you look at the results, and you figure out, is this good, is this not good? You start with the instructions you get from the teacher and what you read in books, but then you have to apply it to your own situation. So you're learning not just from the books, you're learning from your own breath, you're learning from your own mind. When you figure out what's not quite right, you figure out, okay, what then should I do to change what I did? And then you go back and you do it again, and you do it again, and you do it again. So the powers of observation and ingenuity don't replace the effort, they just make it more finely tuned. But that quality of persistence and the desire have to stay there. It's simply that you learn how to temper them properly. So you know when to push and when to be patient. Patience doesn't mean you simply put up with whatever. 
means you realize you're in this for the long haul. And sometimes the mind needs a little bit of time in order to mature. It's like that image of the, the image of the mango. You want a ripe mango, and so you ask people, what's a ripe mango like? And they say it's yellow and soft. Well, you look at your mango, and it's green and hard. And so you squeeze it to make it soft, and you paint it yellow. And so you get a soft yellow mango, but you don't get a ripe mango. Sometimes it requires just watering the plant, taking care of it, and waiting for it to mature on its own, at its own speed. It's not totally on its own, because of course you're caring for it. But the mind does sometimes need time. Other times you have to push it, otherwise, otherwise it just gets kind of lazy. So here again, using your powers of observation and your ingenuity, you figure out when's the time to push, when's the time to simply tend to things. One of the monks here came to the monastery, and before leaving home he wanted to bring some of his library. So he sorted through the books and kept just a few that he brought. And one was a, a book on learning how to swim, because as he said, it had really good advice on how to practice, not only learning how to swim, but also principles you can apply to practicing any skill. And a lot of it was maintaining proper form. Even if you don't have a lot of time to practice, make sure that when you do practice, you maintain proper form. And that you be really observant about what's getting results and what's not. So here, proper form is keeping the mind with the breath, keeping yourself centered here with a sense of well-being, so the mind and body feel good together. And then watch. Ask questions. Stick with it. And that way your desire, instead of getting in the way of the practice, as desire sometimes can do, it gets tempered. It becomes a base for success. So you have to find what the Buddha was teaching. He wasn't being defeatist. He says there's victory. There is a true happiness that can be attained through human effort. It's not in a lot of the activities that most people assume will lead to happiness, and that's something you do have to accept. But he says your desire for true happiness is something that you should honor. That's what he himself did. He gave his life to his desire for true happiness, and got results. If you give your life to that desire, and round out that desire with all the other bases for success, you'll get results too. There's nothing defeatist about this at all. Pure victory.